Hi everyone, and welcome to our session. I'm Kristen Brandt, the co-founder of She's the First, an organization that makes sure girls everywhere are educated, respected, and heard. I'm also a former Global Laureate Fellow with IYF. Hi everyone, my name is Kate Kama, and I am the Director of Programs at She's the First. Today we'll be discussing including voices to evaluate impact, and we're so thrilled to be able to do this from across the globe from Nairobi and New York. To be honest, we had a hard time choosing the title for our session today. And that's because we have two big goals. The first one is to help you integrate the voices of your beneficiaries or your constituents or your clients, as you'll hear us call them today, into your work. This is incredibly important because we're all here because we're trying to shift the power dynamic. We're trying to change the system. And yet what we find in the girls space is that often we talk about how powerful the voices of girls are, we talk about what great leaders they are, and yet we actually don't invite them into the rooms where decisions are being made. And that makes no sense really because they're the ones who are ultimately impacted by the work. They have the most inside knowledge about what it is that we're trying to achieve. And so if you were working to flip the power dynamic, if you're working to change the system, it makes no sense to retain power away from the people that you are trying to help, that you're trying to serve. And so today we're going to think about and talk about how to bring those constituents into the room and really understand what is and isn't working for them just by listening, by having a conversation. Our second big goal today is to show you how to use that integration as a method of evaluation, both for yourself as well as for funders. Often, we measure our impact based on what we know or what we think funders are looking for. Today, we'll use a methodology of listening to your core constituents as a way to truly assess our impact. We hope you can be able to use this information as a way to paint a correct picture for all your stakeholders on what is truly working best for your program. Today, we are essentially talking about how to hold a focus group. A focus group is definitely a term often referred to in research. However, it is one of the easiest methodologies for a small team especially to be able to gather insights on the impact of their project. You might be wondering, why should I hold a focus group? We have three things to offer. You might want to hold a focus group if you are designing a new project or a new program in your existing framework to get buy-in from your existing constituents and to better appreciate what their felt needs are to incorporate that in your program design cycle. The second reason you might want to hold a focus group is to be able to better understand what the success drivers of your specific programming are. This could be things that you already know. However, we also guarantee that there might be insights that will come out through this process that you are not aware of. And finally, you might want to hold a focus group to better understand why specific components of your programming are not working. One of the most important pieces to success with a focus group is deciding on who will facilitate. It's incredibly important because you want to make sure that you're your constituents can actually trust this person and that they feel comfortable talking to them about the impact that the program has had on them so far. That means that ideally that person actually isn't part of your program. That's because it's too easy for constituents to think that that person is biased or that their words are no longer going to be anonymous. Whereas if you have someone who is loosely connected to the organization or to your project or someone who's not connected at all, it's actually easier for your constituents to feel free to open up, express themselves, talk about what's working and what's not working for them because they don't feel that guilt of letting you down when they're talking about something that, that doesn't work. So we recommend, if, if at all possible, do try to find someone who is outside the program or your project. But that said, you still want it to be someone that your constituents can relate to. So you want to look for somebody who has a similar background to them. So for us, when we're, we're running a program with girls, we often, for our focus groups, will bring in someone who is, um, you know, not a mentor with that program, but who has potentially mentorship experience, is from the same background as the girls, and is actually quite young. So we'll look for someone who's not older than 30 so that the girls can feel comfortable opening up to them. 
So you can think about in your context with your constituents, who are the types of people that they won't have to explain the circumstances of their life to? Who's going to kind of inherently understand what it is that they're going through? Um, and who will they be able to open up to rather quickly? So again, you're looking for somebody who's not associated with the project as much as possible, somebody who's going to be able to relate to them. Um, you also want somebody who's going to be familiar with the issues at hand. So that's going to come through both a combination of the fact that they have a similar background to your constituents, but ideally they do also have some programming or project knowledge so that they can ask more in-depth questions, they can ask follow-ups, they, they're able to kind of host that conversation with a level of expertise. Your facilitator is also going to be in charge, by the way, of collating all of the information from your focus group. So they're the ones who are going to be able to translate back to you and to say, hey, you know, here's a theme that I saw emerging. Um, you know, your constituents are feeling really pressured by this element of your program or your constituents are feeling that they are not being fully included in this decision making process and that's something that they would like to see changed. So you're going to want somebody who's a little bit nimble and, and able to pull those threads from the conversation. Finally, even though your facilitator has all of these, uh, all of these elements, you're also going to want an assistant facilitator. Ideally, that assistant facilitator kind of matches all of those elements as well, um, but they're actually unlikely to be talking much during the focus group itself. You want that assistant facilitator in the room to be able to take notes ongoing. Those should be anonymous. You shouldn't you know, attribute anything to a specific girl, um, but you do want somebody who's able to capture exact quotes. If your constituents, your girls, whoever it is that you're working with, if they are um, comfortable with it, actually using a recorder and getting the exact conversation can be really helpful as well. But you just want to make sure that the, facil that the facilitators do protect the anonymity of the group. Creating a focus group might differ slightly depending on whether you're creating a focus group for an existing project or for a new project. Regardless of the objectives of your focus group, we encourage you to come up with a selection criteria to reduce the biases in how you recruit the 8 to 12 participants. A focus group should have a small enough number to enable each participant to respond to all questions posed during the actual focus group. Allow us to unpack uh, the nuances between selecting criteria for an existing project and for a new project. If you're recruiting for a new project, we encourage you to use multiple ways of recruiting your participants. You may want to use advertisement, flyers, and nominations to get the best caliber of your participants as possible. You want to spread your net wide to be able to catch uh, a, 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 a better a better, a better number of participants who fit the criterion uh, you have selected. If you are recruiting participants for an existing project, it's important that you communicate the selection criteria to reduce power dynamics that might come to play during your programming. If you have multiple numbers, you might want to use a random selection criteria. Um, you know, you can use a spreadsheet and be able to just come up with the names randomly. It is really important to make sure that your participants are as similar in their background as possible in terms of age and their social economic status and their literacy levels because those are things you need to you need to think about during the actual uh, focus group. If you're running a focus group, for example, for teenage mothers and you're trying to find out the drivers of teen pregnancies in your community, you would most likely want to separate um, mothers and girls who have not had children, just to make sure that each participant feel comfortable and can be able to share their own candid experiences without feeling ashamed or embarrassed in a group that people don't identify as them. You want to plan to have between two to three focus groups. You will reach a critical saturation point, and that's the sweet spot that you're aiming for, when you're not hearing anything new back being said to you by your focus group participants. You want to make sure that your focus group is held at a date and a time that is very, very uh, inclusive and uh, convenient for your participants. For example, if you're holding a focus group for, for students, 
you want to make sure that you are cognizant of exam uh, timetables of extracurricular activities that they might be more excited to attend than your focus group. So make sure you're well versed about the date and the time and the venue that makes sense. Use venues, especially if it's for participants you don't know that are well known within the community. You might want to use where appropriate public amenities such as public halls or religious centers or where it's appropriate and culturally uh, acceptable, you can decide to use um, a park and sit under trees. If you're programming for participants that you typically work with on a regular, you might also want to change the venue that you're using. We encourage you to use a different venue to change the shift of their thinking process for them to recognize that they're not necessarily coming from a mentorship program, for example, but rather they're coming for a focus group for them to actually be able to share their insights and their suggestions on what's working and what's not working. We typically uh, discourage incentivizing your participants because this often in our experience, skews the data that your participants will be giving to you. Instead, we encourage you to provide transport reimbursements and refreshments in lieu of actually giving money uh, to your participants for their time and for their insights that they have provided. So let's talk about designing your questions and, and how to actually run the focus group. Remember we said that picking your facilitator was incredibly important. One of the reasons for that is because their mode of questioning needs to be really dynamic and empathetic. So there are three types of questions at large. So there are open questions, closed questions, and short answer questions. Open questions are going to prompt a story, it's going to prompt a sentence in response, you're really asking for them to give you a more thorough explanation of something. These are questions that might start with phrases like, how, uh, why, mm, how might someone your age feel about fill in the blank. These questions should make up the bulk of your focus group and that's because you're not really looking for your constituents to confirm or deny things along the along the way you're not just looking to check off a box you're really looking to understand what their experience in the program has been so that means you want to give them as many open-ended questions as possible now there might be times when you're trying to get clarity and you're trying to just kind of uh, seek further understanding or, or make sure that you really are understanding what they're trying to say. And so in that case, you might employ a question that's either closed or short answer. A closed question has a yes or no response. Um, did you like this event? Did you enjoy this program? Yes or no? That is not going to tell you a lot because it's not going to tell you why they did or didn't like it. So you might ask that question as a lead-in to get kind of a bigger response from them or more of an explanation from them, um, or you might get it to kind of reconfirm something they've been telling you in their open answers. Same thing with short answer question. A short answer question is going to give you maybe one word or a phrase. Um, how many times do you think it's reasonable for girls to need to leave the house to get water each day? Um, they're going to give you kind of a, a singular answer for that. They're going to say twice. I think that's reasonable. And then you would follow that up with an open answer question, right? So that that way you're, you're just getting more understanding along the way and you're really diving in. Please remember that the goal of a focus group is not to teach, is not to correct misunderstandings. The goal of your focus group really is to understand how your constituents are feeling, what they think is working, and what isn't working for them. It can be easy to have the impulse, especially when you're someone who works in social change and someone says something that doesn't quite align with those values or um, even if they've misunderstood the goal of a program, they, you want to make sure that they know what the right answer is or what the truth is. Um, you know, for example, in hosting focus groups with girls, there have been times that girls have given blatantly incorrect information about sexual reproductive health. And as a facilitator, it's really important that you don't correct in that moment. 
because you're not looking to shut them down. This is not a teaching moment. This is a moment where it's really important for you to just keep listening, nodding empathetically, um, giving them cues that you're really hearing what they're saying. If they give you incorrect information or if they're repeating things that show that there's a great misunderstanding, that's really valuable because it tells you that within your program, there's a disconnect happening. So you can have the facilitator kind of mark that with a red flag. That's something that as a project, as a program, you want to work on later, um, but you don't want to correct them in the moment. You don't want to stop the process of listening and understanding in order to correct. Beyond thinking about what questions to ask your participants to how to recruit participants for focus group, it's important to spend time thinking about the logistics of actually how to run the focus group. It is imperative that both the moderator and assistant moderator plan to arrive the event or plan to arrive the venue well before all the participants. You want to really put your best foot forward and to set a good precedent and a good tempo for the day. For obvious reasons, when your participants arrive, greet them enthusiastically. You do want them to respond to your questions after all in a short while. Where appropriate, you may consider having some soft background music playing in the background as to create an ambience that is welcoming to your participants. We encourage both the moderator and assistant moderator to have their name badges on at all times. There's nothing as comforting as a stranger walking into a room and recognizing instantaneously a name that they recognize either from email or a phone conversation inviting you to the focus group. You may also want to consider printing out name tens before the focus group or having participants make their own on arrival at the venue. If you're working with younger participants, you also want to make sure that the early birds have a space to be able to be creative. You can have a station where they have toys or where they have mandalas that can be able to color and draw to be able to keep them engaged as they wait for the road, the show to hit the road. We do also encourage setting up the focus group room in a circular manner. A circle not only helps the facilitator maintain eye contact with all participants while they're sitting, but also makes participants seated feel they are part of a collective, that they are equal, that they can be seen, and hopefully they are heard. On arrival, this is an important moment, especially if participants had not sent advance a parental request either by email to collect them. Use the registration process also to gather all the parental contents just to make sure that you've covered your bases. If you are thinking about using a audio recording device such as a dictaphone, it is good practice to ask for verbal consent once again, notwithstanding the fact that you already have written consent, just to make uh, participants feel that you do see them, that you do appreciate their values and their own uh, their own uh, comfort levels. Once they have agreed and given uh, an affirmative, you may put on the dictaphone and place it in the middle of the circle. This will enable you to be able to capture the sound and encourage participants to project their voices uh, loudly. It's important to spend a few minutes uh, to do an icebreaker and activity before you go right into the question and answers and the question and the discussion sections. It's important that the icebreaker is uh, appropriate. If you're using uh, participants who don't know each other, they can icebreaker can be a way for them to actually uh, say their names as well. But an icebreaker, regardless of whether you're working with all participants, or new participants is a space for you to truly break the ice, to make them as comfortable as possible, and to make them really in the zone to be able to go into the focus group uh, conversations. We also do encourage you to recognize the context of the cultural norms that you're working in. There are some instances where singing the national anthem or praying before starting is acceptable. We encourage you to ask one of the participants to lead this process just to make sure that you're making people as active as possible and really participating right off the bat. After having an icebreaker, we also encourage you spending a bit more time coming up with collective group norms to enable you to have uh, agreed ways of engaging with each other for the next 90 minutes that you might be uh, working together as part of the focus group. It's important to use these collective agreements to be able to hold each other in check, to also be able to break down any power dynamics that may come to play. We encourage you to spend time thinking about what to do with phones, 
spend time unpacking how do participants feel comfortable responding to a question posed to them? Do they want to raise their hands? Do they want to go in a chronological answer or do they want to speak up if feel moved by it? And finally, you're ready to start your focus group. We encourage you to, again, reiterate what the objectives are Introduce yourself as the moderator and the assistant moderator. It's important that the assistant moderator especially introduces herself, uh, especially because they might not be necessarily sitting in the circle. They need to also explain why they might not be sitting in the circle. They might opt to sit a bit further out the circle in order to be able to have a desk to be able to take notes. They might also want to be outside the circle to be able to welcome participants who are running it. It's important to use that moment to explain why uh, not everyone is in the circle, just to make sure everyone is aware of who's, who's in the room. It's also important to make sure that you have used the space to explain uh, any logistics uh, to the participants. If there are washrooms, please direct them and show them where they are. If there's a water station, please also let them know that they are free at any time to get um, their water. It's also important to mention to participants that should they at any moment want to rescind their consent to be there, that they can practice that. And they don't need to give anyone an explanation, they can just literally stand up and leave. It's important to reaffirm that to participants right off the bat because it's it's we do know that there are some conversations that might become difficult, especially if you're dealing with a bit of trauma and a question pose might make you feel a bit uncomfortable. It's important to, net, to let participants know that consent is throughout. It's not just a one-off and just because you say yes or your parents say yes, you have to stay through this whole portion. It's important after all the questions have been asked, and maybe before we get to the questions, again, sitting in a circle helps the moderator not only keep eye contact with all participants, but it's also a good way for the, for the moderator to be able to balance any power dynamics that may come to play. Having all the participants have their name tags on is also a good space for a moderator to call out participants by name, especially those who might be left of the conversation or not speaking up. It's important as a moderator to always remind participants to project their voices. So if you're not able to hear them, make sure they understand why you're asking them to project their voice. It's not only for capturing it uh, for the assistant moderator who's taking notes, the dictaphone, but for all other participants to understand and to truly hear what their contributions are. Use all uh, your tricks that you have up your sleeves and that you've gathered through your years of experience to also acknowledge participants who are enthusiastic in sharing, but also find ways to make sure that you are, ask them to take a step back, to have other people step back into the circle to contribute. Where participants' answers are long and windy, use diplomacy and a lot of tact to be able to try and help them narrow down uh, their sentiments in a sweet and concise uh, time frame. It's also really important to make sure you're summarizing and you are recapping the key points that participants are making to make sure that you're not only remaining engaged, but also appearing to them that you're truly listening and not going through the list uh, and, uh, you know, ticking off your questions uh, like a checklist. And finally, when you've gone through all your questions, it's important to ask either the moderator or the assistant moderator to recap key highlights of the conversation to the participants. This not only checks that you heard them correctly, and this is an opportunity where participants can clarify or can add on or take out if they feel how they said it and how it was captured was different. This is a good opportunity to make sure that you've captured the, the insights and the views correctly, and also to make sure that participants leave the space feeling that truly their voices were heard and they were valued. It's also important if you have the details to explain to them potentially how long this process will last, when they'll potentially hear back from you, and any further information that you may have to give them. And finally, the moderator and assistant moderator should both thank the participants for their time and for their candid conversation that they've had in the duration of between 60 to 90 minutes. At this point in time, it would be a good idea to offer them refreshments and their transport reimbursements back home. If you had done a pick up and a drop off kind of service, it's important to make sure that you know you gather all the items that the participants may have had or may have used during the focus group and make sure you spend time calling their parents to make sure that they are aware that you're now taking them to the drop off site to enable the parents and guardians to be on site on the time you're arriving at the venue.
Finally, it's important to unpack how to use the data you've collected. If you had multiple moderators and assistant moderators conduct the focus group, this process should be done together. Through the process of bringing them all into one room, you're able to have all the questions that you asked in each group. Usually they should all be the same and standard. And against them, you can be able to write what the responses of each participant in each focus group were. You can either put this on a spreadsheet or you can use flip charts to be able to uh, try and put all this data together. Inviting all the moderators together and assistant moderators will help them also be able to reflect on some nonverbal cues that they may have been able to see and observe. Remember, the point of the focus group is also to be able to capture qualitative data, which is data that you can see or observe. So this is a good process to be able to make sure that you're not only reporting on what you had participants share, but also what you saw. Some participants, especially in different contexts, might be saying one thing, but their body language is completely saying the contrary. So you definitely want to put a note in that kind of data just to make sure it's not skewing up your, your overall findings. Finally, we invite all the moderators together because easily you can be able to draw off inferences and themes from each of the focus groups, especially when you see it on a master spreadsheet. We invite this process or we encourage this process to take place shortly thereafter from the focus group just to make sure that any observation that you may not have written down are not lost um, through memory, memory losses. It's really critical to also make sure that you invite a program staff who was not involved in either the program uh, focus group or in the collation process, just to be able to look at what the overall themes are, especially when they can see the master spreadsheet and they can be able to quickly see what the themes are. This is a space to be able to help invite fresh insight or fresh eyes, so to speak, to be able to pick out anything that you may have missed off. So their process or their invitation into the space is not to help you unpack the data or to try and explain it. It's just to help see whether you've captured all the themes or all the parallels that can be drawn from the data you've collected. It's really important to make sure you document case studies uh, using the qualitative data you found. For example, if you're running a, a, a focus group on the drivers of teenage pregnancy in a certain region, you can be able to use um, a case study to show based on the focus group of X number of people that you had uh, for um, you know, X number of days, you are able to uh, understand that some of the key challenges or some of the key drivers uh, as mentioned by the participants include X, Y, and Z. The case studies can also be able to expound and say, based on us, be as descriptive as possible, especially describing um, the social economic status or the background of your participants to make sure that anyone reading this data can be able to see uh, or to think if they're designing a program with similar participants, these are some of the key things they should be, or in the context that they might be implementing, these are the key things they need to consider. Once you have completed your case studies, it's important to as much as possible and much as reasonable to share your key findings with your participants. Especially if these are participants you work with on the regular, you can be able to share with them um, what are some of the changes or interventions you're going to adopt in your programming based on their insights they had. Why we do this is to enable participants not to feel as tokens, that they're just part of a process, but it's important for them to really feel validated and feel, feel hard. Even if you're not able to make substantial changes in your programming, just coming back and closing the circle is a good practice that we encourage uh, all practitioners to adopt. If you're reporting this to a donor, it's important to mention to the donor that your program designs and your subsequent iterations are designed based on feedback from participants through a focus group. So you can be able to easily tell a donor, for example, I'm changing my program intervention model because of insights I had from my participants that this methodology or this approach is not effective. For example, if you're running a program for after school, uh, for after school teenage girls, and you're running it on a weekend, for example, and you notice most of them don't come, you might want to change the intervention, especially if you hear them saying, we would much rather have these interventions during our school um, uh, academic hours or uh, co-curricular lessons, because then we are already in school, we're easily available, as opposed to the weekend where transport might be a challenge or getting permission from our parents to come back to the school. So small things like that, it's important to make sure you communicate them to all your stakeholders on why you're making changes 
And this is an important process to be able to reiterate ever so often. If your program design is every one year, it's important to also use focus groups to be able to feed forward with the graduating class to make sure that fresh insights and fresh perspective is incorporated into the next program design cycle so that you're not relieving your past mistakes. We hope all this was useful and we can't wait to hear back how all this has helped you incorporate some changes into your programming. Remember that you can host these focus groups both as a way to question a specific line of inquiry, so when you're encountering a challenge or you're about to implement a new program and you want to check in and see why am I experiencing this challenge or how will my constituents react to a program, how can I make a program more effective, but they also serve as a great way just to have regular check-ins with your constituents. The benefit here is that the more often you host focus groups and the more often your constituents see that your project changes as a result of their in input, the more power they're going to feel, the more ownership they're going to feel, and the more confidence they're going to feel in your program or project. And more than that, the more effective your program is going to be. So think about focus groups as one way to integrate the voices of the constituents that you work with. And also think about the many other ways you can do this, including adding leadership positions to your board or to your leadership team where constituents can sit and have a voice and a role within the organization. Think about ways that they can contribute to policies. Think about ways that you can bring them into the room when big decisions are being made. Ultimately, our goal is to create social change. And social change doesn't happen if we maintain the same hierarchies of power. So the more you can play with that, the better it's going to be for all of us. If you have any questions on this process or on this presentation, please feel free to reach out to us at kristen at she'sthefirst.org or kate at she'sthefirst.org, and we're happy to help. Thanks so much.